Father God, as we look into your word now, we pray, Lord, for open hearts and minds as we see your message for us. We pray for your word, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. Some years ago, we attended a service in another place, and after two and a half hours, the speaking pastor broke for lunch. We were all wondering what we were going to do to kill time until we could get back again. Just a, an example of coming together in worship to listen to God's word. In 1976, Howard Hughes, the richest man in the United States with an estimated worth of 2.5 billion, which is a lot of cookies, died. He'd influenced for thousands and thousands of people and owned many hotels and casinos and a movie empire. But interestingly enough, the only honor he received on his death was a moment's silence which had been proposed by company executives in his Las Vegas casinos. Time magazine of the time put it this way, Howard Hughes's death was commemorated in Las Vegas by a minute's silence. Casinos fell silent. Hundreds of people stood uncomfortably around, clutching their paper cups full of coins for the slot machines. And the blackjack games had paused and the crap tables were silent while the stick men cradled their dice in the crooks of their wooden shovels, all looking most uncomfortable. After a short while, one of the pit bosses looked down at his watch and said, Okay, let's roll the dice, he's had his minute. <laughs> and this got me to thinking. Some folk are inclined to treat God the same way. Coming together week by week, sitting in the pews of various churches, looking at their watches, thinking, well, we've given him an hour, it's time to move along. It's almost as if services of worship are uh, getting in the way of life. And as you'll have get gathered, today we speak on the subject of worship, a topic which means different things to different people. If I were to ask you now, what is springs to mind if I mentioned the word worship? If I asked six people what worship meant to them, I'd probably get six different answers. Some would say it means songs, it means a music ministry. Others would say it means prayer and praise and maybe meditation. Others, liturgical chants and rituals, bells and smells of big cathedrals. Some to choruses, some for hymns. Some free worship, dancing and skits. Some see, hmm? And flags, yes, we can have them too. I've seen that before. To many, a service worship is judged on how it makes them feel. If they don't leave a service feeling good, there's something wrong. The truth is that our prayers to the risen Lord, there is no right or wrong way to worship God, so long as he is worshipped, so long as he is glorified. He is, after all, the creator of everything, including us. He knows more about us than we know about ourselves. He loves us beyond our wildest dreams and imaginations. We cannot possibly comprehend the depth of love that God has for each one of us individually. And it's that which is worshipped in awe and respect. So today I thought we'd analyze what worship is, the particular elements of worship. And checking my entomological dictionary, which is a good word for this time of the day, which is, of course, the derivation of words, where they come from. The word worship is derived from the old English word, wordscape, meaning to venerate or honor the worthiness or worth-ship of an item or a person. The suffix ship being the state of worth. In other words, worth being the value and ship being the state or capacity of that worship. worth. Which begs the question, what is God worth to you? 
which is a good question. What is God worth to you? What is God worth to me? Everything. Everything. So the heart of worship is not what we can get out of worship, but what we put in it, and that's the bottom line. Worship is not getting, worship is giving. The more we appreciate who God is in our lives, the more we want to get Him, and so the more meaningful our worship. The more we praise His glorious name, the more meaningful worship in ourselves becomes. But there's another aspect of worship which is worth noting. The worship of our Lord is a very personal thing. And herein is yet another biblical mystery. We've spoken of mysteries the last few times I've spoken. But here is another one. As I asked at the beginning what worship actually means to each one of us, what it means to you, to some songs, to some praise, to some liturgical ritual, and so on. But the fact is that the outward manifestations of worship in our emotions are visible actions to our internal feelings. I would suggest that our emotional interaction goes far deeper than merely singing songs. It is far more intimate a relationship with God our Father, which brings us to the word worship in Greek. I'm not a Greek scholar, so forgive my pronunciation. The word in Greek is proskuneo, and the derived meaning is to kiss. Worship in Greek means kiss. One of the most intimate acts of any relationship. And thus, to worship God meaning, means basically to kiss God. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? And what father doesn't love the kisses of his children? And we are the children. In Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, we see, Kiss the Son, a reference to Jesus. What brings to mind at this particular stage is that song by Mark Lowry. We remember we sing it around the Christmas time, Mary, did you know? One of the verses there is, when you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God, which is a lovely thought, but it's based on a theological fact. Thinking of our perceptions of worship, we need to remember that true worship is never undertaken out of convulsion or out of ritual, but is an act overflowing an impulse of our hearts, an expression of gratitude and joy flowing over various ways, like a kiss, an expression of love. And as I was researching worship in the scriptures, there are a number of ways that we worship God, but there are seven particular references and details in regards to worship mentioned in the Hebrew, all of which are manifest in this church and other churches as well. And what better way to examine the elements than to look through the Psalms? Today I chose Psalm 95 because it covers nearly all the particular elements and attributes of worship. In Psalm 100, incidentally, there are going to be quite a few references here. If you're making notes, get your pencils ready because there's a few of them. In Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Amen. This is the first element of our worship, the Greek word toda, meaning thanks or adore, an expression of visible thanks and adoration, extending hands to God in reverence coupled with Sacrifice and praise to God. Audible praise, confessions, thanks. Sacrifice, which includes our time, which includes our prayers. This is our sacrifice to God. The next action we see, the next element of our worship, is in the word yada, which literally means hands to God, which we see frequently raised in adoration to a loving God. Because your love is greater than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, 
and in your name I will lift my hands. It's an impulse, it's a heart feeling. We raise our hands to the glory of God. The word yada. Our next word we come to is barak, to bless, to bow down before, to kneel in recognition and reverence. It's an attitude of reverence and submission. In times gone by, quite often priests and, and uh, ministers would prostrate themselves on the ground before altars or whatever. It's a sign of submission. In Psalm chapter 5, verse 7, But I, by your great mercy, will come into your house in reverence, I will bow down. Another aspect of our worship. As we come, we bow our heads in prayer. We bow our heads in meditation. We lift our heads to sing songs. It's an attitude of reverence. It's an attitude of praise. It's an attitude of submission. Next, we come to the noisy bits, which is always nice to, to hear. Speaking of noisy bits, when we lift our voices up in praise and in prayer and in song, it's amazing you can tell the hearts of people who gather together in the Lord's name by the enthusiasm that they put into the songs they sing. We've been to many, and I'm sure you have as well, where some of the old songs have literally raised the roof out of the enthusiasm in the hearts and minds of those who are giving praise to a living God. The next word is shivach, to shout of praise, to address in a loud tone, to comment, to declare glory, to declare triumph. That wonderful song, clap your hands all you nations, shout to the Lord with cries of joy. How awesome is our Lord most high. It's the joy that comes out of knowing that God is with us. It's the joy and the manifestation of that joy in our lives, the manifestation of the joy of God's people when they make a noise, a joyful noise to the Lord. We see it all the time when the kids come up front here, which brings us on to our next word, which is halal. No relation to the other halal. One of my favorite psalms, Psalm 150. I didn't bring my trumpet or the shofar this morning. I should have done. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the heart and the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with strings and flute. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with the resounding cymbals. We see that, don't we, when the kids are just letting loose. The joy of the kids just making a noise, making a joyful noise to the Lord. Some churches have people dancing around with diaphanous robes and flags and things. But there's something about kids really letting loose. We can do the same thing. In fact, some people do make an awful lot of noise, but that's probably because they can't sing. But it's a joyful noise nonetheless. I remember a very good friend of ours who uh, was actually an ordained lady uh, in one of the churches, had the voice of a slightly out-of-tune foghorn. And that's been kind. But she loved the Lord. And when she let rip... You knew she loved the Lord. She was making a joyful noise, literally noise, to the Lord. But he's a loving God, thank goodness. Our final words is tila, which is a spon to spontaneously call out to the Lord in a number of different ways, to burst forth in the spirit of inspired song. It's an interesting one, this, because in Psalm 145, I will exalt you, O God, my King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and exalt your name forever and ever. How often have we been meditating, looking out over nature, looking into a forest, looking out over the ocean, when you are overcome with this desire just to praise God, to lift up your hands and look at the sunset and thank the Lord God for who he is in our lives, that raining down of his spirit in our lives. Another aspect, another idiosyncrasy of our praise. 
All these actions all declare our personal relationship with the living God. There is no particular formula. There's no right or wrong procedure. Our love for God is a heartfelt reaction and a knowledge of his love. And the greater we have of this knowledge, the more we realize he loves us. And the more we realize, he, we realize that he loves us, the more we want to praise him. The more we praise him, the more we realize he loves us. We strive, we should strive to increase our knowledge of that love. It's almost impossible. It's only by his spirit that we can possibly come to know any more about him. As I've mentioned before, an old book which is covered in mothballs, but very hard reading called The Cloud of Unknowing. It is impossible for us to know the depth, the height, the width, the breadth of the love of God. It is absolutely impossible. But by the Spirit, he, re he reveals more of himself bit by bit to us. And the more we have knowledge of this, the more we are able to worship with the characteristic of love and praise and joy in our hearts at any time and at any place. Which is where we see in the final reading, which we had this morning, with Jesus and the, the uh, Samaritan woman, where he actually makes reference to her that there is no particular place where you praise the Lord. It is no longer just Jerusalem or on the mountain. He tells us that our place of worship is not restricted to one place or to one ritual. In other words, it's not at just at any particular hour on a Sunday. It's anywhere and at any time. Worship is a way of life. It's not a time slot. When we were in Sorrento some years ago, we'd been traveling around Europe, and um, we were looking for a place to worship. We hadn't been to church for a couple of weeks. And we went down a little street, and there were these big domos, the big cathedrals around with all the bells and jewelry and all that sort of stuff. And there was a little door just opposite, opposite one of these piazzas, which had a little brass plaque on it, Assembly de Dios, Assemblies of God, but it was a house. Anyway, there was a time there, and we rocked up at the allotted time on a Sunday, and there was, ooh, 40 people, 50 people? Yeah, 40, 50 people had gathered in this room, and we sat down on little rickety old chairs. And the pastor came out and was speaking, and we sang songs, but the interesting thing about it was there were about four or five different nationalities there. There was French and English and a couple of Australians, yeah. German, etc. We all sang the songs in our own particular language. <laughs> but God is omnipotent and he can sort out. He can sort out who's saying what. But the thing that struck me at the time was the fact that here was a group of people giving praise to a glorious God in their own language, in their own heartfelt way, they just love the Lord. And the joy of coming together as a family, regardless of their nation, stood out. Different languages, different songs, but at the end, it was a true worship in spirit and in truth. So the final question then, really, for all of us is, what is God worth to you? What is God worth to you? More of our time, more of our love, more of our praise. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this time together, and we thank you, Lord, that by your Spirit you do reveal yourself. We thank you, Lord, that you place in our hearts that yearning desire to be more like you, to be in your presence, that we can truly lift our arms to you and say thank you, Lord, for the love that you show each one of us through our blessed Savior Jesus. Amen.